Thanks, Max. I want to begin with a question, and that is, how important is a priest to your relationship with God? How important is a priest to your relationship with God? Interesting question. It's the question that I want to try and explore today. And so as we jump in, it's important that we understand what exactly a priest is. And so to help us with that, I thought we would turn to the invaluable source of all truth, Wikipedia. According to Wikipedia, a priest is a religious leader authorized to perform the sacred rituals of a religion, especially as a mediatory agent between humans and one or more deities. Now, I don't know if I've exactly put it like that, but it's not bad, so let's roll with it. But it leads to the question, do you think you need one? Do you think you need an authorized religious leader to perform religious rituals for you, and in particular, to mediate between you and the divine? Do you need one? Well, if we asked ancient civilizations or people from ancient times, practically all of them would have said yes. And so if you go pre-civilization, you kind of, we've got fairly good evidence that you know, large families, the head of a large family, they would sort of take on a priestly role back in ancient times, so building altars, making sacrifices. By the time the uh, family grows to, say, the, top, the, the size of a tribe, uh, fairly common for you to have maybe a, a witch doctor or a shaman or, or some form of religious leader. But certainly by the time you get to, to scale and you have really, you know, developed civilizations, and so I'm thinking here of you know, ancient Egypt, Persia, Greece, Rome, uh, plenty of other places like this, uh, all of them had priests. Right? By that stage, the religion is more developed. And so really every ancient civilization had religious leaders, who conducted spiritual rituals and mediated for them on behalf of the divine. Now, as you'd expect, uh, the nature of the rituals varied, but I do think it's helpful for us just to appreciate the almost universality of priests in the ancient world. Pretty much everyone believed that a priest was absolutely critical when it came to human interacting with the divine. So that's the ancient times. What about today? Do we need a priest today? Well, it probably depends who you ask. So if someone is not from a religious background at all, not surprising, they probably won't see much need of a priest. But even then, depending on the religious background you have, if you do have one, your answer might change a little. And so, for example, those from a Hindu or Shinto background probably would say, yeah, actually, priests are important. Uh, from what I can tell, both of those have religious leaders um, who do various rituals in the temple and are seen in some way as a kind of mediator uh, or, uh, with the divine. Uh, while those from his Islamic or Buddhist backgrounds, well, not so much. Uh, Muslims have imams, Buddhists have monks, but at least from what I can tell, they don't have priests. Uh, you see a similar uh, difference or variation within Christianity. And so if you've come from a Catholic or an Anglo-Catholic background, chances are you will say the priest is absolutely critical. After all, it's the priest who offers the Eucharist, or, you know, the Mass, the, the Holy Eucharist on the altar. Uh, the priest is the one you confess your sins to. The priest is the one who offers absolution. And so you'd say, absolutely, a priest is vital for my relationship with God. But if you've come from, say, a more Protestant background, which, by the way, is what we are, uh, you might say, well, no, probably not. Because I think we tend to view our church leaders not as priests, but as uh, ministers or pastors. And they lead us through you know, the teaching of God's Word, through teaching, encouraging, rebuking, exhorting. That's what our leaders do. And so again, I, I suspect the gut reaction for the majority of Protestants would be to say, no, uh, we don't need a priest, and thank you very much, I don't want a priest. Here's the thing. Today I want to try and help us explore the idea that that is both right and wrong at the same time. I say that because as Matt has already shared, we're in a series called Prophet, Priest and King, in which we're looking at what some have called the three offices of Jesus Christ. See, in the Old Testament, uh, God gave him people, his people, prophets, priests and kings, three different groups, in order to serve different functions in their relationship with him. In the New Testament, however, 
there's a sense in which those offices cease, not because they're no longer important, but because they've been fulfilled. Now Jesus is our prophet, our priest, and our king. And so again, I, I want to say the instinct of most Protestants is both right and wrong. It's right because you don't need church leaders to be your priests. You don't need them to mediate between you and God. That's not because priests are unimportant. They're critically important. But what you need is the great priest, Jesus Christ. And what's more, I think if we fail to grasp this, which frankly I think a huge percentage of Protestant Christians probably do, they fail to grasp this reality, I think it leads to a cheap view of grace, a distorted view of God, and a failure to appreciate the beauty and the wonder of the gospel. And so my plan today uh, is to change all that. <laughs> uh, let's pray that God does. For some of you, uh, it'll be a paradigm shift. It'll fundamentally change the way you think about your relationship with God. For others, it'll probably just be a reminder, a refresher. Uh, but my hope and prayer is that for all of us, it prompts us and encourages us to draw near to God in worship and adoration through our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, how are we going to do it? Well, uh, I have three points today. We're going to look at the place of the priest, the promise of the priest, and you better believe it, the perfect priest. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't done that in a while, but I just thought... When the alliteration is there, you've got to take it. You've got to take it. The place, the promise, and the perfect priest. Let us jump in. The place of the priest. So as you think about uh, the importance of priests, the place of priests in our lives, it, it's interesting to look back at history and think, well, what did the ancients do? It's interesting to think, what do different religions do? But at the end of the day, what is essential is to ask, what does God think? Does God think that priests ought to be important in our lives? And if we ask that question, the clear answer that we get in the Bible is a big yes. See, after uh, Adam and Eve, you know, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, they're kicked out of the garden in chapter 3. After that, uh, there really is no organized worship of the one true God, at least not initially. That's not to say no one worships Him. They do. So Cain and Abel, you know, in chapter 4 of Genesis, they both bring offerings. Um, the, the heads of the patriarchs of the, the families often do end up functioning in a priestly way. You also have people named priests like Jethro and Melchizedek, but, but there's no formalized priesthood, no kind of formalized worship of God in that way. That all changes, though, after the exodus from Egypt. And so uh, Abraham's descendants have multiplied in Egypt God then delivers them out of slavery in Egypt, brings them to himself at the promise, uh, sorry, at Mount Sinai, and that is where he first gives them the law and constitutes them as a nation. Now, a key part of the law is the Ten Commandments, which you're probably familiar with, but another key part of the law is really fleshing out the place, the role, and the importance of priests in the life of God's people. So, I thought this week, you know, how can we, how can we explore the place of the police priest in, in Old Testament Israel's life? Uh, here's where I've landed. I don't want to just tell it to you. Uh, I'm not going to just um, give you a bunch of scattered verses. And so what I want to try and do now is take you to one representative passage that I think helpfully fleshes out uh, many of the principles that were at work more generally. Uh, the context, it's the one that Max read out for us before. The specific context of the passage is God is instructing Moses about the uh, ordination, the commissioning, if you like, of the priests. But I do think you, as we read through, you'll be able to glean a number of the principles that are true more generally of how priests functioned in the life of God's people. So I'm going to take you there and we're going to look at four truths about the place of the priest. Uh, I'll give them to you as we go. Number one, priests were appointed by God. So our passage begins, Do for Aaron and his sons everything I have commanded you, taking seven days to ordain them. Now again, the context is God is giving Moses instructions for the ordination of the priesthood, but just notice the reference to Aaron and his sons. Why specifically them? Well, uh, these were the ones that God had appointed to be the priests for him. 
See, it's not like any um, you know, little young boy or little young girl growing up in Israel could think to themselves, I want to be a priest one day. Um, well, they could think it, uh, but they wouldn't be allowed to do it. And frankly, if anyone tried, but they weren't a descendant of Aaron, God would put them to death. And so this, this becomes a major deal for the people of God, and the author of Hebrews makes a massive deal on it. Being a priest is not an honor that someone can just take upon themselves. I am going to be a priest. No, no, no. The priest, priesthood, if you like, was an honor bestowed on someone by God. They had to be a male descendant of Aaron, or as we'll see later, uh, someone that God has sworn in with an oath. So number one, priests were appointed by God. Second of all, if we keep going, priests made atonement by purifying with blood. Priests made atonement by purifying with blood. Let's keep reading. Sacrifice a bull, says God to Moses, each day as a sin offering to make atonement. Purify the altar by making atonement for it and anoint it to consecrate it. For seven days, make atonement for the altar and consecrate it. Then the altar will be most holy and whatever touches it will be holy. Uh, that word atonement there is a theological word. It's one of the very few theological words that actually has its roots in sort of Anglo-Saxon language. And so it means at one moment, atonement. Uh, and it, it's a word that comes from the idea that because God is holy and we human beings are sinful, we cannot be together. We cannot be at one with God. It'd be like you uh, trying to snuggle up to the sun to get warm. Uh, the blazing holiness of the sun, if you like, would just consume you. It's the same with God. We can't snuggle up to God to get warm. His blazing holiness would consume us. And therefore, the only way to achieve at one moment, atonement with God is for the stain of our sin to be removed so that we're purified and made to be red hot holy like God is. That's what the priests were responsible for achieving for God's people. And furthermore, the key ingredient was blood. Now, in this passage here, the, the major reference is talking about making atonement for the altar, but the same principles were true when it came to people. Atonement was only made possible through the sacrifice of the animal, through the smearing of blood on the altar, and therefore the purification of the worshipper. Now, if you're wondering... Why blood? Why is blood so important to this whole process? It's because blood represented the life of something. And so when the animal was killed and its blood was spilled and just drained out, it represented uh, that the animal was dying in the place of the sinner and that the animal, the, the penalty for the sinner's sin was falling on the animal rather than them. That's the second thing. The priest atoned uh, with blood. Third, priests offered sacrifices for sin on a daily basis. Priests offered sacrifices for sin on a daily basis. And so we'll keep reading. It says, now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs, a year old, day by day, regularly. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. For the generations to come, this burnt offering is to be made regularly at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. All right, so through the ordination process, this seven-day period, there's a twice going, one in the morning, one in the evening. But in verse 42, which is you know, after those little brackets, it goes on. So every single day, for over a thousand years in Israel, the priests would have made a sacrifice in the morning and in the afternoon at twilight. The thing is, that's not the only sacrifices being made. If you go and look at Leviticus 1 through 7, there's sort of five different sacrifices being outlined. The priests had to make sacrifices both for the leaders, for the nation as a whole, for themselves, for the common people sometimes. Why? Well, because they kept sinning. As long as Israel kept sinning, sacrifices kept having to be made. And so therefore, on any given day in Israel, hundreds and sometimes thousands of animals were slaughtered and in the temple and their blood smeared on the altar and the priest did it all. Fourth, 
Priests made it possible for God to dwell with his people. Priests made it possible for God to dwell with his people. Uh, We've already hinted at, at this through the language of atonement, but if we just finish our reading, it says, There God says, I will meet you and speak to you. There also I will meet with the Israelites, and the place will be consecrated by my glory. So I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar, and will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. At the end of the day, that's the goal. God says, I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. And so when the blood had been spilled, when purification had been made, when atonement had been achieved, the white hot glory of God would dwell in the midst of the Israelites. And then the people of Israel would know the privilege of living in the presence of and having access to the one true living God. That's the place of the priest. Before we move on, I just want to pause for a moment and invite you to consider the impact that this whole system would have had on the faith of the average Israelite. Or to put it differently, what might this whole system of priests, sacrifices, temples, taught the Israelites about the God that they worshipped? I can think of at least three things. Number one, sin is serious. Sin is serious. Imagine if every time, or imagine your approach to sin, if every time you broke God's law, you had to come to church and kill an animal. Every time you killed it, you're, res- you're reminded that this animal is dying in place of you. What this animal is, what's happening to the animal is what you deserve. I think our approach to sin would be radically different. Number two, I think we learn atonement is costly. Atonement is costly. Right? For the average Israelite, the animal they sacrificed was a goat from their flock or a goat that they had bought at the temple, which is fairly expensive. Imagine if the only way for you to maintain your relationship with God was to bring in your cat or your dog and kill it every time you sinned. Now, there's no such thing as cheap grace in Israel. Third and finally, priests are essential. See, Old Testament Judaism was not a private religion. A priest was absolutely critical to your relationship with God. Because sure, you could kill an animal, but only the priest could take the blood, smear it on the altar, only the priest could make atonement. And so if you wanted to be at one with the God of the universe, you needed a priest. Now, and maybe you're sitting there thinking, oh yeah, but Tim, that's ancient Israelites. It uh, doesn't matter. You know, like we're today, that's ancient Israel. I want to say think again. Uh, because the God of the ancient Israelites is the exact same God that we worship today as well. Now, yes, as we're about to see, the system of the priesthood, the sacrifice of the temple has changed, but nothing else has. Sin is still serious. Atonement is still costly. And a godly priest is far more important than ever. So there's the place of the priest. It does bring us, though, to our second point, which is the promise of the priest. See, one of the challenges of the system we've just explored, and you might have kind of been able to see it as we're going through, is just how central to the relationship with God, to Israel's relationship with God were the priests. Right? They were the mediators. Now, if they did what they were supposed to, if they were good priests, it might have been okay. But a lot of the time, they weren't. In fact, a lot of the time they were corrupt or they failed to do what they should and so they allowed the Israelites to bring dodgy sacrifices. Or with the result that uh, sometimes God's anger burned out against his people. Now, I think it, it, it's, it's very difficult for us to appreciate uh, how significant, how serious it was to have a bad priest. Uh, us living today, it's impossible to grasp the significance of bad priests for the ancient Israelites. Uh, but a bad priest was the religious equivalent of having an incompetent bomb squad trying to defuse an atomic bomb. Or it's, it's like having you know, someone mucking around while trying to fix a nuclear ra- reactor at a nuclear power center. 
if the priests failed to properly atone for the people's sin, Israel risked being consumed by the atomic holiness of the God dwelling in their midst. And it sometimes happened. Sometimes uh, it was quick and sudden, as with Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, when they tried to offer um, strange fire on the altar. Other times it's slow and um, uh, indirect, as when God cursed the people in Malachi's day. But again, bad priests meant bad things for God's people. So God could have left it that way. He could have just said, oh, well, you know, that's the system. But instead, what he starts to do is to make promises uh, over the course of the Old Testament that one day I'm going to send you a different kind of priest. Now, there's at least three very specific promises that God would send a different kind of priest to his people. For the sake of time, we're only going to look at two of them today. But the first one comes in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35. Um, The context here is that God, uh, the prophet of the Lord, sorry, is speaking to Eli. He's just told him, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are going to die because they're corrupt priests and they're ruining it all for my people. And then he says this, 1 Samuel 2.35. God says, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house and they will minister before my anointed one always. Uh, Now that promise likely has a few horizons, but it is the first specific promise that God makes that one day he's going to send a faithful priest. It's not a priest, well, unlike Nadab and Abihu, Hophni and Phinehas and so many others like them who were corrupt, this priest will be faithful and do as God asked. Second promise comes in Psalm 110, Psalm 110 verse 4. Uh, This time it's a promise of a forever priest. God says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Uh, That's Psalm Psalm 110. Uh, It's often described as a messianic psalm. In other words, it's a psalm in which God fleshes out what the promised coming Messiah is going to be like. And what we learn there is that God has actually sworn an oath to the Messiah saying, you're going to be a priest, but not a priest like in the order of Aaron, but a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And we all say, oh, that makes it so much clearer. (laughs) Who on earth was Melchizedek, you ask? Great question. Uh, We don't know heaps. So he appears one other time outside of Psalm 110. It's in uh, Genesis 14. And we only get a very slim amount of detail about him. Uh, He blesses Abraham. Abraham gives him a tenth of all he has. He is described as the priest of God Most High. He is described as the king of Salem. His name is Melchizedek. That's it. He's an intriguing figure, though. In particular, the author of Hebrews sort of notices him and goes, oh, that's interesting. Uh, you know, Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And he's the king of Salem. Salem means peace. And so he's also the king of peace, king of righteousness, king of peace. What it's worth, Salem is almost certainly Jerusalem because uh, Jerusalem literally just means the city of peace. Uh, I'll butcher this, but Jerusalem, Yer is city, Jerusalem, city of peace. And therefore, who was Melchizedek? Well, he's most likely this ancient king of Jerusalem. His name means priest, uh, king of righteousness and he's a priest of God most time. So uh, Psalm 110 says, God has promised that the Messiah, he's going to be a priest like that guy. Not a priest in the order of Aaron's sons, but a priest like Melchizedek this priestly king of righteousness that even Abraham looked up to. And what's more, he's going to be a forever priest. So they're the promises. One day, God would send a faithful and forever priest who will minister before him and his people all their days. Now, before we move on, I want to take you one more place. Because I want to help us see that even under the old system of priests, 
there was a kind of promise, or maybe a better yet would be to call it a kind of clue from the Holy Spirit that something better was still to come, that something wasn't quite right about the system as it was established. Uh, and you get this, actually you've got to scroll forward for this, but it's Hebrews chapter 9. The author writes, when everything had been arranged like this, he's talking about you know, the tabernacle and the inner room and the outer room. When everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people who had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. Right, as we saw in point one, the, the whole point of the priesthood, of the sacrifices and atonement was to enable God to dwell with His people. It was to enable them to come into His presence. But the author of Hebrews says, yeah, but it just never really happened. Because again, he's just been talking about the tabernacle. And he says in the first room, you know, there was like the lampstand and other stuff like that. And sure, the priest could hang out there. That's the outer room. It was called the holy place. They could go in and out. They could do what they wanted there. But then behind a curtain, there was another room, an inner room. It's called the most holy place. And in that room was the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, the closest thing that the people of God had to God's localized presence on earth. And so the author of Hebrews is saying, yeah, yeah, sure. The high priest could go in there, but only once a year, and never without blood. And so actually, the high priest is the exception that proves the rule. Right? The whole system was a constant reminder that despite all the sacrifices, God's people couldn't really draw near to him. They couldn't really get access. They couldn't really live in his presence. I said, then he just dro he drops this bombshell at the end. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed. Not yet. It was coming, but not yet. In other words, uh, there would have been people in ancient Israel, you know, walking up with their goat, ready to offer the sacrifice and thinking to themselves, you know, God clearly wants a relationship with us. He clearly wants to dwell amongst us. He clearly wants us to, to draw near to Him. Why else would He set up the system? But, but at the same time, it clearly doesn't quite work. After all, surely, surely we could all get in that holy place. There, there wouldn't be curtain after curtain after curtain blocking us out. And you can imagine those who knew their Bibles thinking to themselves, maybe, just maybe, one day when the faithful priest, when the forever priest comes, maybe he will open the way. Maybe he will make it possible for us to get into the holy place and finally be at peace with God, dwell in his presence and have access to the living God of the universe. So there was a promise. It was the place of the priest, the promise of the priest. I want to finish by thinking with you about the perfect priest. And as we do, we're going to focus in on Hebrews, uh, the book of Hebrews, because the book of Hebrews is the book in the New Testament that deals more with the high priesthood of Jesus than any other book. Uh, as I was reading through it this week, I was like, oh, there is so much. I'd love to preach on the book of Hebrews at some point in the future. So I'm looking forward to that, uh, but I'm going to main, um, restrain myself. And I want to try and take you to a few places in the book of Hebrews. So we won't camp out in one passage. I tried to, but it just wouldn't quite work a few different places in the book of Hebrews to help us see how Jesus both fulfills and supersedes each of those four points we learn about the priest and the role of the priest in, in ancient Israel. Understand what we're doing? So first of all, um, Jesus was appointed a priest by God. Now, I suspect this is not going to be a major concern for most of us. Um, but it was a massive concern for the Jews that the author of Hebrews is writing to. And so I just want to spend a brief moment on it now. See, the, the main issue here is that Jesus was not a descendant of Aaron. Remember, that's what the priests were, descendants of Aaron. Jesus is a descendant of David in the line of Judah. 
And so the first thing any self-respecting Jew would have said when a Christian comes up to them and says, hey, you don't need those priests. We've got a great priest. His name is Jesus. They would have said, no, he can't be a priest. He didn't go in the line of Aaron. You can't just make yourself a priest. Remember, God appoints the priest. Here's how the author of Hebrews deals with that objection. Uh, Hebrews 7, 14 to 17. It says, For it's clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek arrives, one who's become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, I know the details in there might be a little odd and some of those uh, goes over your head. Just try and get the big picture for me. The author saying Jesus was the forever priest that God was talking about in Psalm 110. Uh, in other words, Jesus was appointed by God. He's like Melchizedek, this king of righteousness, this um, king of peace. And what's more, he'll go on to say, actually, Jesus, unlike the Aaronic priests who simply just sort of became priests because of their parentage, Jesus was sworn in as a priest. God says, I swear to you. And the author of Hebrews says, that's better by far. Again, that's probably not a big thing for us, but it's important in the Bible, so it should be important for us. Second, Jesus made atonement by purifying us with his blood. Jesus made atonement by purifying us with his blood. Hebrews 10, 1 to 4, and then verse 10 at the end. It says, The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they have not stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But these sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now that is a staggering comparison, isn't it? See, it's not that blood was ineffective. They're just using the wrong blood. For over a thousand years, bulls, goats, doves, lambs had been slaughtered in the temple. A river of blood would have been throwing out. Imagine, just imagine the blood that was spilt. But the author says, you know what? It didn't work. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Why? Well, because it's only an animal. But how can the death of an animal really take the place of a person and atone for their sins? It can't. But those deaths, all that blood, all those bodies was a shadow that lets you know, you know, when you see a shadow, something is making the shadow. Something was coming. Better blood was coming. And so he concludes, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Jesus is both the priest and the sacrifice. I know what a sacrifice it was. At the end of the day, it was the perfect, it was the blood, the precious blood of God's one and only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that could atone for sin, cleanse our guilt and make us holy. Which also means you only had to do it once. And the other priests, they're every day, every day. Third, Jesus only offered one sacrifice. Take a look. 10, 11 to 14. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. I love the contrast. Every priest stands. Now, day after day, they're offering sacrifices. What about Jesus? He makes his sacrifice and then he sits down. <laughs> um, why? Well, job is finished. At the end of the night, 
uh, one of my favorite things to do, our favorite things to do. After we've fed and bathed the kids, we've put them to bed, we've made the lunches for the next day, we've cleaned up the house, we've had our dinner, finally you get to sit down. Your body's aching, but finally you get to sit down. It's a sign that the job is done. At the time of writing, at the time of writing this letter, the author of the Hebrews, um, the priests, the temple was still functioning. So the priests were all still standing. They're making their sacrifices, killing the animals. Jesus was sitting. He's sitting in the right hand of God, waiting. Just waiting for the fruit of his sacrifice to be applied to those who would trust in him. Waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. Fourth and finally, Jesus makes it possible for God to dwell with his people. Jesus makes it possible for God to dwell with his people. Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. Therefore, this is the kind of the big wrap up. Therefore, brothers and sisters... Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with a full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. This is the climax of the letter so far. And it's the application of the point that he's been making for the last couple of chapters about the priesthood of Jesus. But just, you, you just got to love this line. Since we have confidence to enter where? The most holy place by the blood of Jesus. You have to appreciate how paradigm shifting that would have been for anyone raised under the Old Testament system. Because they've been thinking, no, 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 hang on. We have no confidence to enter the most holy place. Only the high priest can go through those curtains, and even then, only once a year, and even then, only with blood. You cannot go there. God's told us time and time and time and time again. Now the author says, hey, Christian, you don't have to be the high priest. You don't even have to be descended from Aaron. Heck, you don't even have to be descended from Abraham, according to the flesh. If you have the blood of Christ... You can enter into the most holy place. As we say, he's not talking about the most holy place through the curtain in an earthly, earthly temple. He's talking about the true holy place, the throne room of heaven, God's dwelling place, which is more insane. You know those bits in the movies where there is, you know, a room is on fire but the door is closed and so you, you don't really know what's behind the door, you know, the house or the building or whatever it is. Maybe you get a clue of it because there's like smoke sifting up from the bottom of the door and then someone opens the door and inside you see this blazing inferno. That's a little like what the throne room of heaven is like. Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, got a vision into the throne room of heaven. He says it's full of smoke Uh, Above the throne that God was seated on were angels. They're called seraphim, which literally means burning ones. And they've got six wings. uh, With two, they're flapping to stay uh, in the air, to fly. With two, they're covering their feet so they don't touch the bottom. With two, they're covering face so that they're shielding their face from the burning holiness of God. The author of Hebrews says the blood of Jesus gives us confidence to open that door and walk into the furnace. And so he says, let us draw near to God. Let us open the door and draw near. Now in the context, he is talking specifically about prayer. Uh, He made a similar point back in chapter 5. Let us approach God's throne that we might receive mercy and grace at our time of need. And so can I just ask you, um, ask myself this too, do do we make use of the privilege? Grace City, when you pray to the Father in the name of the Son, through the power of the Spirit, you have greater access to God and are more in his presence than even the high priest was in the most holy place in the temple. That is the point the author has been making. The way has been opened. 
The curtain is down. You have the blood of Christ. So approach the throne of grace with confidence. As I said, the immediate context is about drawing near in prayer, but he will go on to speak of holding unswervingly to the hope we profess and encouraging one another as we see the day approaching. What's the day? The day is the return of Jesus. When Jesus returns and God finally, once and for all, comes to dwell among his people and make his home with us forever. And so, yeah, Jesus as our priest enables us to draw near to God, but he also enables God to draw near to us and to make his home with us, which, as we've said, is the goal all along. Let me close. How important is a priest to your relationship with God? How important is a priest to your relationship with God? As we're saying, the Scriptures would say, indispensable. That's a truth we need both on an everyday basis and on a judgment day basis. We need it every day because Christ is our priest who intercedes for us. His name is the one we need to plead as we enter into God's presence and approach the throne of grace in prayer. So we need him on an everyday basis, but boy, do we need him on a judgment day basis. See, the scriptures teach that every man, woman, and child will stand before the throne of God one day to give an account. Uh, Revelation 20 says, The earth and the heavens flee from his presence. Uh, If the earth and the heavens are afraid, you don't stand a chance. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Unless, of course, you have Jesus as your priest. In that case, you can have confidence. Uh, confidence that you can approach the throne of grace not in fear but with a clear conscience knowing that all your sin has been covered and that you will be welcomed in as a child of the heavenly father do you have that confidence Uh, if you don't can i encourage you repent of sin trust in christ today because that confidence can be yours but grace said if you do have that confidence then please join me in prayer now as we draw near and enter the most holy place in prayer. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we do not presume to enter your throne room, the most holy place, on the basis of our own merits, but on the merits of your Son, our great High Priest, Jesus Christ, the one whose perfect sacrifice atones for all our sins. Forgive us when we take sin lightly and we cheapen your grace and fail to live as we should. Lord, make us holy as you are holy and empower us by your spirit to resist sin and walk in righteousness all our days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.